Hi, I'm Matt Culkin, and I'm co-chair of Steptoe's Financial Services Group. And welcome to Steptoe's Financial Services University, where we offer a series of short, focused conversations with my colleagues from across our various practice groups and offices around the world. Today, we're going to talk about financial services regulatory issues. And I'm thrilled to have two of my dear colleagues with me, Micah Green and Rick Schiltz. Both have tremendous experience navigating Washington, with Micah having served as the president of the Bond Market Association and the first co-CEO of SIFMA, and Rick having spent nearly 40 years at the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, including nine years as the director of the Division of Market Oversight, in particular during the post-financial crisis Dodd-Frank years. So Rick, Micah, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. So let, let's start sort of broad. There, there's, a, there's an alphabet soup of federal financial regulators in Washington, and their role has, has only grown since the financial crisis 12 years ago. How has that affected your practice? How has it affected your clients' relationships with regulators? And how does it impact the way regulated industries go about their business? Uh, if I could uh, take that one on, uh, Matt and Rick, uh, these are interesting times. In 2008, there was a major financial crisis. Uh, it was referred to as the credit crisis or the Great Recession. Uh, but if you track back in history, and in my over 30 years in the financial services space, I've seen it virtually, virtually every couple of years, some scandal, some recession, some other market event occurs that results in either a significant regulatory reform by the, on the part of a financial regulator, or in many cases, actual statutory changes that develop, that, that, that result in the creation of new regulatory agencies, the creation of new reg regulatory frameworks over markets or institutions. And that's what happened in 2008. When that credit crisis hit in 2008, Congress went into action very quickly. You had a situation where you had a, a Democratic administration and a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate, but a Republican president had just left having to deal with the credit crisis. So there almost seemed to be uni unanimity that reform was necessary. And you saw that happen incredibly fast. In fact, they were legislating the regulatory reform, what is referred to as Dodd-Frank, uh, even before the crisis was fully over. Uh, and then when that legislation passed in mid-2010, uh, the rulemaking process took, took place almost, almost immediately. Um, and the volume of rulemaking was just historic. But I also make one comment. Because the legislative process was so quick, uh, Congress deferred or even left to the agencies to fill in the gaps. It wasn't quite a Mad Libs game where you fill in the blank, but along the way in the rulemaking process, there were many situations where it wasn't entirely clear what Congress's intent was, and the agency had to, had to make an educated guess as to what the intent was and, and, and complete the rulemaking process. I, I've, I've called this that the rulemaking process in Dodd-Frank was both a rulemaking and legislating process. In a sense, the, the regulators uh, leg, finished the legislative process and wrote the rules. You ended up with several new agencies and several new regulatory regimes, the biggest of which was the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and most particularly, the regulation of the over-the-counter swaps and derivatives market, which I know, you know Rick is near and dear to Rick's heart, and yours as well. And, and that, had, that energized so many regulated entities, so many entities that didn't know they were regulated before, so many markets that had no clue that they would ever be regulated, uh, to a point of, of mobilization. And, and that's changed everything about the practice of law in this space, about the running of business in this space, and this representing an industry in this space. So if, we, if I could, let's, let's drill down on that just a little bit. So I know from, from our time working together, we've, we've had a number of clients come to Washington to meet with agencies that they only recently learned about, and often are meeting with regulators who similarly are new to the market that they're regulating. This is particularly true in the swap space, but maybe you can just talk a little bit about how the dynamics have shifted with regulators creating new rules and creating new policy through regulation 
where there is this discretionary authority under Dodd-Frank and similar laws. Well, I would say that the last 10 years have introduced a new era of regulatory advocacy. Historically, unless there's some big scandal or crisis, the rulemaking process is a cyclical endeavor, and there are rarely significant changes unless justified by something happening in the marketplace. Now, because of the rapidity of events in the marketplace that engender a reaction, regulated entities can no longer afford to think that if I stay away from my regulator, they won't see me and they won't come after me. Now they need to engage more assertively, because there's also a recognition that policy is made in statutes, policy is made in rulemaking, policy is also made in interpreting the rules, and even in the compliance and enforcement of those rules. So given that policy is formulated or views are formulated throughout the process, if you don't engage with your regulator, you're likely not to have a regulator that is informed and educated about the particular circumstances of that regulated entity. So either directly or with their law firms, these regulated entities are engaging much more assertively with the regulators, or frankly, and having been a trade association executive during my time, they're relying much more on their trade associations too to advocate things that are common to the breadth of the industry. But it's no longer the situation that a regulated entity can afford to think that not making eye contact is your best defense. Rick, I'm curious from your perspective, you and I have both served as division directors at the CFTC, although admittedly you bested my tenure by several decades. In particular in the last 10 years or so, how did you see from sitting on the other side the commission evolve and change, and how did that impact the way registrants engage? Well, I think, Matt, the key point was, as Micah said, was the passage of Dodd-Frank. I think that's what just fundamentally changed kind of the focus of the agency, and because its mission and oversight was so broadly expanded as a result of the Dodd-Frank Act, basically now all aspects of derivatives trading are subject to some form of CFTC oversight, and this includes any venues or exchanges where trading occurs, any dealers who are involved in a derivatives trading activity, intermediaries, and even foreign exchanges that want to offer derivative products in the U.S. And it's expanded, as you're saying, to entities that formerly weren't regulated, at least in the context of their derivatives trading, like banks that now must register as swap dealers and other large participants that may have to register as major swap participants. And formerly, the interdealer brokers that traded swaps now have to register as swap execution facilities. And it's not just a matter of being registered. There's lots of compliance requirements that go with being registration, and that has involved much CFTC focus in ensuring that these entities are in compliance and potential enforcement action if they're not. Another key area, I think, is just reporting. Whereas the CFTC has always collected data on futures and options trading, a new regime was set up for swap where entities would be registered as swap data repositories, and every swap that's executed must be reported, and not just reported, reported under very specific requirements and under very specific deadlines. So the potential there for entities to not be in compliance with some of these requirements can be fairly large. I think another area just to touch on is retail commodity trading, especially in the context of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. This is an area that the CFTC is still involved in and still focusing on how to interpret the statutory changes, but it's created a lot of uncertainty in the industry as to which types of trading comes within the CFTC and must be registered as opposed to that which would be exempt from registration. Just one other area to touch on quickly is that the CFTC, the Dodd-Frank has made some changes to what may be considered violations of the act in terms of manipulations. 
there's a new area, a new um, type of uh, activity called spoofing, which the CFTC has been very aggressive in going after entities that may be um, uh, causing prices in the futures markets to not be representative of what they think the market activity should be. So I guess uh, these are just a few things to touch on, but I guess in summary, um, the CFTC has a very broad mandate to regulate all aspects of futures trading. And given that the futures markets and future swaps and option markets basically involve so many different commodities and such a wide uh, scope of the U.S. economy, the potential for any individual entity or firm to be come under uh, the, to intersect with some of these requirements or to be potentially involved with some sort of enforcement activity is it's fairly high and it's something to be aware of. So, so Mike, uh, Rick just touched on a number of important developments, registration, reporting, certainly record keeping, investigations, market surveillance. Now, I'll let you have the last word here, but from the perspective of a market participant, how do all of these things affect how they do business, how they conduct compliance, how they conduct legal oversight? And what, what are you seeing when you talk with clients about all of these new changes? Uh, it depends on the client. Uh, a client that only operates in the United States at least has one jurisdiction with which they have to master and figure out how they can do business within that. But then it gets even exponentially more complicated as they operate around the globe and how they interact with one another around the globe and how they interact with clients that are that may be non-U.S. based and present in the U.S. or or you know you know U.S. based not present overseas. Uh, so so it, it is it is a very complicated thing that um, you know. A lot of the U.S. financial regulatory framework has been built upon, uh, to a degree, self-regulation to start. Uh, and self-regulation, and in the security space, it's with FINRA, and in, and in the commodities and swap space with the CFTC, it's the National Futures Association, NFA, has, has always built around the best way to ensure markets are, are you know, that, that entities are compliant is to, is to impress upon them that when they find it themselves, when they police it themselves and avoid the problem, you're in much better shape than us having to find you breaking the rule. And that has worked quite well since the Great Depression in, in the early parts of the, of the 20th century. But now the political pressure to ensure that the regulator is not just a tough cop on the beat, but sets a pretty good speed trap as well uh, that the push and pull between self-regulation and regulation with a heavy stick has also resulted in regulated entities having to having to adjust the way they operate, uh, and and, it, and it's become a very it's it's obviously a costly enterprise. Having said that, uh, the cost of lax regulation or lax enforcement and lax compliance. I think it, by policymakers is perceived as what leads to these occasional uh, breaks in the marketplace that cost, you know, future and current retirees trillions of dollars of market value in their portfolio that disrupts markets, economies and futures markets, which as we know also affects the food chain and other commodities that are critically important. So the consequences of it going off the rails have become that much greater. So to answer your question in a word, it's gotten complicated. And, and that means that you know, you need to beef up your internal compliance and legal teams. You need to rely more on outside counsel. And uh, it, 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 it has just, it, someone who has entered this space previously unregulated has got to be going through a traumatic experience. And, and let me just say one more thing and, uh, and, then, and then we can move on. But another aspect that's happened over the last few years as a result of developing technologies uh, and Rick mentioned crypto and digital currencies, blockchain, fintech generally, automated trading, AI. All these things have 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 are bringing in new new entrants to the marketplace that I can assure you were never regulated before, and now they're entering an environment that has become very heavily regulated, and that's a difficult mm -hmm. transition to make. And yet regulators don't necessarily understand their businesses which then really requires an education effort 
and as, as I said earlier, a proactive education effort to ensure that whatever regulation is ultimately decided upon is practically is, is practical and can be can be implemented in a way that doesn't put someone out of business in an unintended way. Well, I think I think you've uh, given us a lot to think about, and I think I know what one of our next episodes will have to explore. <laughs> Rick, Micah, thank you both for joining today. Thank you, thank Matt. You, Matt. Thank you, Rick. Well, that does it for another episode of Steptoe Financial Services University, where we dove into the world of financial services regulation. You can always watch more of our episodes and learn more about our financial services practice at steptoe.com. Thanks for joining. We'll see you next time.